NHL 24 has been out for two weeks, and like many others, you're struggling to score and play defense. And now, you're searching for ways to win games. Well, no, look no further. In this video, I will go over the strategies I have used to win 93% of my total games and also walk you through how I execute my game plan to perfection. Let's get into the video. First, let's start off with your controls and I'll first talk about the controls that you must have on specific settings. Auto backskate must be off. You will find yourself giving up too many breakaways and too many little give and go cut plays in the middle if you have auto backskate on. You want to be able to control whether or not you are attacking an attacking player while backskating or if you want to turn around and keep up with the pace off the rush. Shooting controls. Always up. You don't want it to be camera relative. You want it to be always up just so you can maintain in your head that yes, flicking up is always going to work. Vibration off. You don't want vibration. It's just going to cause soreness in your hands. Online pass assist percentage, 100%. All pass assist does is it opens up the amount of range that a player has receiving the puck. It does not change where your passes go. Again, it is only for players receiving the puck and the radius that they can receive it. And now we go into the main controls. In NHL 24, they have introduced the total control scheme. This allows people to have one button access to a lot of skilled moves, such as the Michigan or between the legs as well as one button defensive maneuvers like the puck chop or the body check, specifically the hip check. For most new people, total control will be the scheme to go to. It is very easy for folks to just get used to it, one button, everything is just all right there for you. But for me personally, I use skill stick. The reason why I use skill stick is because for me, timing is everything. When I'm doing a deke like the Michigan, I want to be able to control the pace at which I do the deke and having the steps, the extra steps actually allows me to have a higher success rate doing these deke. Hip checks for me have always been easy with L, B and right stick clicked in and puck chop has always been easy for me with the right stick right there and you flick up. So for me, I use skill stick, but for most newer players, you are going to want to use the total control system. Next, let's talk about your visual settings. A lot of these visual settings are up to you. Things like uh, camera perspective. If you want to play down, you can, although I suggest you play up. Indicator size. All of those things like overlays are up to you. But the one thing that you need to have a million percent is a good camera angle. For me, I use overhead because I like to be able to have a top down look at the ice in order for me to set up my plays in advance of when I actually get the puck. Two other camera angles I'll suggest if you do not like overhead are zone. Zone is like overhead if you move slightly backwards and we're a little bit lower to the ice. You can see further behind you, but it's not quite top down like overhead. You'll be able to spot things that are happening behind you such as potential cherry pickers on the other team. And you'll also be able to see a little bit lower on the ice. Maybe you'll be able to see an in tight passing lane more. But I like a more top down approach. So for me, I go with overhead. Other camera I suggest is dynamic high. Dynamic high is higher up than zone, not as high up as overhead, but dynamic high will actually move you slightly to the left, slightly to the right. It'll tilt you and this will help you find optimal passing lanes. Such players that I know that have used dynamic high in the past are Fierce Snipes Gold and Own the Blue. These are top end 1v1 players who have used dynamic high. And when I've used it, I've seen some of the advantages that it can offer. But again, I use overhead. For you, pick one of these three camera angles, get used to it, stay with it. You don't want to be switching all year because it'll just confuse you more. Pick the one you like and work with it. On ice trainer is quite the divisive topic. A lot of people do not like on ice trainer because it's just an eyesore. But for me, there are two useful on ice trainer tips the first one is offside warning offside warning is important because sometimes you do not see someone who is in the zone perhaps they were laid out with a big hit or they're stuck behind the defense you might not be able to see them without the flashing gray and red of the offside warning i have it off because i like to think of myself as being able to see that stuff but for a newer player it might be very useful and then the other one that I think is entirely useful is flip dump aiming. Flip dump aim targeting will allow you to see the trajectory of your, your dumps and 
of your saucer passes. It'll look like a little green little arrow or a little green line that'll show you the height you're getting on your saucer passes and dumps as well as how it'll react when bouncing off the boards. This is a very good on ice trainer option to have and it's the one that I will be keeping on all year. Next up, we'll talk about lineup optimization. For forwards, you want your forwards on their shooting sides. So you want right-handed forwards on the left wing and left-handed forwards on the right wing. For center, you can choose either handedness, although most people prefer left-handed centers. On defense, you also want to have players on their shooting side. Right-handed defensemen on lefty and left-handed defensemen on righty. However, for me personally, it is not a deal breaker. If I have a defenseman like Quinn Hughes that is 85 overall and has terrific skating and offensive attributes, I'm not just going to replace him with some 83 overall, 84 overall right defenseman if I don't feel like he benefits the team. Players like Quinn Hughes or players like Kale McCarr or even big hulking defensemen like Patrice Breezebar or Brooks Orpik can play the opposite wing because their skill sets allow for it. On defense, it's nowhere near as important to have shooting sides since you're not going to be ripping D2D one-timers all the time and simple slap shots and wrist shots from the point can suffice through screens. Picking a strategy that works for you can oftentimes be difficult, especially in NHL 24 where sometimes the AI do not work as you may want. In NHL 23, it was very easy to set up set plays depending on what strategy we're using. In NHL 24, it's a bit harder. Overload is meant to help you set up one-timers in the slot. There will be a triangle offense formation with one man on the far side flank looking for the one-timer, one man on the back post and another man up high near where the back post guy is sitting as your F3 because on overload, that's, that's what you're doing. You're overloading your offense to one side of the ice. You should be looking for plays on the back post like cross creases and you should be looking for one-timers on the far side flank. For me, I'm not the biggest fan of overload because it doesn't offer a lot of support behind the net if you get up too high into the slot while cycling. Next up is Crash the Net. Crash the Net is a very unpredictable strategy and that's what makes it work. Your players will crash the net for rebounds, they'll get in front of the net for deflection, but however I find that Crash the Net's not even the best option for deflections. Overload is, because Overload has a two layered tip in front because everybody's above the goal line. Crash the Net you might find that your players cut in tight more. However, it's going to be a lot more unpredictable when it comes to finding your supports along the boards and behind the net. Now we go into my favorite strategy, behind the net. Behind the net, you're going to find that there's not a lot of options in the slot, but you're going to have a lot of support on the perimeter. You're going to be able to take the space that's given to you, and you're going to be able to cycle, use the net as a pick almost, and draw defenders out to the perimeter for you to eventually penetrate the slot. Behind the net is a very important strategy because it offers you the most support, the most outlets, while also allowing you to stay close to the net so that you can still hit those cross creases and slot shots once you walk out into the slot. For my sliders, I like to use 10 carry dump because when you have your meter on a zero for carry and dump, your players are going to wait until you enter the offensive zone and they're not going to have a lot of speed. To me, in NHL 24, the carry dump meter is easily the most important uh, slider for behind the net. Because if you have it on 10 carry dump, your players are going to hit the line with a lot of speed. So you can do things like, once you enter the zone, you can rim the puck around the boards to your far side winger. You'll be able to hit more plays off the rush, like little saucer pass cut plays. You might go offside more, but the benefits far outweigh the negatives. I like to have my cycle shoot on zero, a lot of people like to have it on, you know, 5 or 7, 10 maybe. I put it on 0. The reason being is that the only thing that the cycle shoot meter really does is it determines how your AI is going to be situated once they get the puck. If they are on 10 shoot, what's going to happen is that they're going to be in a position to shoot the puck as soon as they receive it. That isn't always the best thing because if they're always squaring up to the net, it means that they won't always be able to deflect pucks and they might not be ready to support you down low. For me, zero cycle makes more sense because I always want my players moving to try and draw out the opponent's AI. I can get to the slot myself, considering how the AI doesn't really cut to the middle anymore anyways. I can make those plays so I can get to the middle myself. I just need all the support. Efficiency energy, I have at 10. I don't find that this does all that much, but just for peace of mind, I put it at 10 so that my players are always going as fast as possible. And then for don't block block, 
I put it at zero because I rather cut off passing lanes rather than having my AI try and block a shot and potentially screen the goalie or deflect a puck into their own net. On defense, I run 110. The reason for this is because on one hold line pinch, your player is not going to surrender to any loose puck. They're not just going to back up. They might pinch if they have a really good chance of getting the puck. And on 10 cycle shoot, I want my far side defender to walk into the slot for potential one-timers. If I'm on zero cycle shoot, my defenseman will focus on pinching up on the perimeter of the ice rather than walking into the middle for a one-timer. If you have your defenseman on shooting sides, you definitely want your cycle shoot on 10 because you want to be able to walk out from the corner from below the goal line, spot the far side defenseman stepping in, and then you want to wire a one-timer to either the far or the short side depending on how the goalie is situated. Next, for team strategies, I'd like to go over my 1-2-2 pass of 1-3-1. A lot of players like to run 2-3 and 1-4 because in this game it's very easy to be aggressive, especially on full pressure. But for me, I'm more focused on preventing breakout passes. A lot of players like to straight line down the boards with one pass. They, they send a saucer pass from the goal line up to the blue line. I want to be able to pick those off on the boards. And for the neutral zone, I run a 1-3-1 because I like layered neutral zone defenses. I want them to have to get past the first layer, the second layer, and the third layer. On one and four, you give up the opposing side of the neutral zone too much, and it allows players to pick up speed and straight line through the middle. On one, three, one, they have to get through three layers of defense, and every spot on the ice is well contested. I have my trap four check on six. This is so that my players play with a little bit more urgency, and if I decide to take anybody in the middle layer or the bottom layer, my center is still going to apply pressure. I play with contained puck and collapsing because I want my players to collapse also not going below the goal line. On protect net, your players will collapse, but on contain puck, your players will collapse and make sure that they are between the puck and the net rather than just collapsing and let, letting people get through the lanes. On contain puck, your center is going to be between their check and between the puck. So they're always going to be in front of the player, ready to strip them with an interception or a stick lift or a poke check. With defensive strategy or collapsing, I do collapsing because a lot of players like to cycle down low. However, if you find that your opponent is ripping a lot of DDD one-timers or seeing eye shots, I suggest switching to tight point. Tight point's going to be uh, allow you to pick off those DDD passes. However, I would start off all games using collapsing and then adjust accordingly. For offensive strategy, I use full attack because I want my players to be able to go through the neutral zone with as much speed as possible. If you execute a lot of D to D passes and find that they get picked off a lot, I would use standard so that your def that your partner defenseman stays back and offers support. If you're confident that you can make a D to D pass without it getting picked off, I highly suggest full attack because you just want your players to get through the neutral zone with as much speed as possible in order to penetrate the offensive zone and set up. If you're on defend lead, you'll find yourself in a lot of 1v5 situations where you have to chip the puck in and chase onto it because your AI does not offer a lot of support if all they're thinking about is defense. That is why I use full attack. And for the breakouts, I use strong side slant and close support. The reason I use close support is because in hockey, most of the goals you score are off the rush. When you score or when you're trying to set up plays off the rush, what ends up happening that you need to go from the boards to the middle with speed. We're able to hit a player on the boards with the puck and then as the center or the far side winger streaks through the, through the neutral zone, you can hit them with a pass, they'll have the puck with speed and you don't have to worry about generating th speed through the neutral zone once you're across the center line. You want to be able to go through the zone with a lot of speed in order to get through any defense that you face. I use strong side slant because when I set up a controlled breakout from behind the net, I want my center to be through the middle of the ice on the strong side. This way, when I make my first read, which is up the boards, the strong side boards. If the opponent decides to cover that board pass, I can then hit my center through the middle without having to go all the way across the other side of the ice. He'll be in the middle for me on my side, and I can just adjust my read from the left winger or the right winger to the center. I can streak through the middle and potentially get a breakaway. So these are my strategies once again. 1-2-2 one, two, two passive, 1-3-1 one, one with a full four check, contain puck and collapsing. Full attack, strong side slant, and close support. Next up, let's talk about behind the net. I'm going to walk through this play after I show it to you the first time, and we'll discuss why behind the net is such an effective strategy and why my sliders help complement it. So first off, lose the face off, we're able to pick it up with Marchand. Then we dump it around the net to our waiting center. We cut behind the net, we wait for that defenseman to switch, send it out front, and we get a really good chance. 
Now, it does not act, er, result in a goal. However, let me explain to you why this is such an effective play. So we lose the face off. Marshan picks it up, and I recognize right away that I do not have a passing lane to my center or to my right winger directly. There are five people in front of my two wingers here. So my only option is to rim it around the boards. Try and get it down here and try and have Marshan, or sorry, try to have Marshan's dump and McCann beat his defenseman to that puck. So the defenseman needs to turn on his back shoulder, which is going to slow him down. McCann can get that by just skating forward. So we rim the puck. McCann is able to get there before his defenseman. And I immediately curl behind the net. Now, in previous games, I would have been able to hit the far side pull shot, which is on this near post here, because Marchand would have set up there. Now what I'm waiting for is I'm waiting for my opponent to switch to this defenseman. The reason that is is because he should recognize that Riley will be unable to get me once I cross the back of the net here. So his best option is to try and defend using his other defenseman who is covering Marshawn. Now when he tries to meet me here, Marshan should back up right here in order to open up a lane and then hopefully Pavelski crashes up here so it's like a two on one. When we play it, he's still there. I send the pass, send another pass and it gets blocked. But what I wanted happened. He felt the need to have to come and crash and try and get me. But by doing so, he opened up that pass and I was able to send another pass across and it got blocked. Now, rimming the puck around is a very smart strategy because it opens up the, the possibility of maintaining zone possession when you have almost no options. Use the boards, they're your friend, and then also take advantage of, of lazy player switches. Almost took advantage of it there. Didn't, didn't work out in the end, but that is good process and that is going to lead to a lot more goals for you. Now let's talk about break-ins and breakouts. So for the break-in, what you're really looking for is going from outside to inside in order to penetrate the middle. On this play, I win the face-off with Marc Messier and I get the puck to Kel McCarr. Now my goal with my defenseman when breaking out is to draw in as many people as possible and then read whatever they are covering. So right here, I'm able to draw in on this play, I'm able to draw in the bleed four checker to Kale McCarr. I'm e easily able to beat him because Kale McCarr is Kale McCarr. But when I get to the left, I'm able to read that my opponent really wants to get Eichel here. He really has Eichel kind of cornered off. The only way I could really hit a pass for Eichel is if Eichel made a cut. But even with increased... AI interceptions, that pass isn't really guaranteed. So what I do is I take a couple steps, I draw him closer to Eichel because he might also think that I'm taking off the boards with Makar. And as soon as I hit the red line and he makes that dedicated decision to cover Eichel in the boards, that opens up Marc Messier and it's just a straight pass right into the middle. Hit Messier with the pass, it's a mini two on one. My AI doesn't hit the line fast enough. But I am able to curl off, hit Eichel with a pass, he's able to take a wrist shot, and that's a high quality scoring chance. When going up the ice, your primary read should be up the boards, but your secondary read should always be to the middle. If the defenseman is going to cut off the boards, that means that there's going to be someone in the middle. Draw the four checkers towards you, draw that defenseman to the winger, and then hit the center through the middle. That is a perfect break in, just couldn't execute on the shot. On any breakout play, your first read should be up the boards. It is the safest way to get the puck out of the zone while also minimizing the damage. If you give away a puck on the boards, you can always collapse in the middle. But a lot of the time, players understand this and are going to cover the boards more. On this play, I get the puck with Kale McCarr, and I immediately recognize that if I make this pass to Henrik Sedin, I will have to make a pitcher-perfect one-touch pass to Hillary Knight to prevent myself from losing the puck at the blue line, because Henrik Sedin is going to either get crushed, he's either going to get crushed by this defenseman who's going to meet him at the blue line, or the puck's going to get intercepted by the winger here. So once I make that read and realize that that is not a viable option, 
I focus more on the middle. I turn, and all of a sudden, his three, four checking forwards who are above the blue line are now stuck on one side of the ice. That leaves this whole side of the ice available. I make a, a pass to Hughes, who has speed going up. Therefore, I don't have to worry on making a backhanded pass. I can make a forehand pass with momentum to Daniel Sedin, who's able to beat Austin Matthews to the middle. I fake like I'm going through the middle, draw in the defender, and then I can outlet it to the wing. And then from there, I have many options. I could have made a pass to Daniel Sedin and waited for Henrik to beat him to the back post. In my mind, I thought Henrik would be too slow to beat Matthews to the back post. So I cut across the middle, take a shot, and it is saved by the goaltender. But once again, your first option should be up the boards. But if the boards are being taken away, you're going to have to find another way. A nice simple D to D pass into open space works. Now also, this demonstrates why strong side slant is so popular. Daniel Sedin is taking the, the spot of Henrik Sedin as the centerman on the breakout. And Daniel Sedin, he still blasts up, but he's in the middle on the strong side. The left side is the strong side here. So instead of him cutting into the middle and cutting into Matthews, he's glancing off to the left because that's the strong side slant. He's slanting on the strong side. That's where the name comes from. So I don't have to pass it into Matthews. Instead, I can lead Daniel Sedin to the left and ensure that my breakout pass is going to be accurate. It's going to be hit with speed. And there's little chance at an interception by Austin Matthews. So read up the boards. If they take that away, make a D to D pass and work it up the other side. Don't be frightened and don't skate into pressure just because you feel like you have to. A simple one or two pass breakout can lead to an excellent chance at the other end of the ice. When it comes to playing in zone defense, it's a lot more chaotic and just collapsing. There's not a lot of structure to it, but off the rush, you need some structure or else you are going to allow a lot of goals off the rush. In NHL 24, breakaways and two-on-ones are already an issue, and I'm going to try and show you here how to stop it. On offense, you can move the puck a lot more fluidly than the defenders can. So as a defender, you need to keep a proper gap. Now a gap is a proper gap is about a stick's length away so that if you go for the poke check, you can go for it and have it successfully. Now the issue in Angel 24 is the poke checks are actually quite bad. Hitting is a lot more encouraged. So with this play, I'm getting attacked at the blue line. I realize he doesn't really have a passing option because his center is going to have to stop because he hasn't already made the pass. I challenge him to the outside, he tries to cut to the outside, and instead of just trying to go straight for the puck, I maintain a gap with him to where I know I can beat him to that far or to that near post if he tries to cut around me, but also I'm going to stay in a position to where he can't just cut to the inside without me doing something. So he tries to go around me, but I have a close enough gap to where with the big hits, because of the auto lock on and the speed boost you get from doing the big hits, I know that I'm going to be able to just stay on him and perhaps knock the puck loose. He turns off, but I immediately have my center supporting me, and that's, that's the benefit you get of driving someone to the outside. Your boards are going to be able to come back and cover up for your mistake. So I drive him to the outside. He tries to make a pass. I poke with Joe Neuendijk, and immediately I'm thinking offense. I have two. I have Neuendijk and another winger high, and I know McKinnon is going to go for that puck. Neuendijk knows this as well, and this is where full attack comes into play. Neuendijk takes off immediately, and Nathan McKinnon has the puck. Joe Neuendijk has already beaten the defenseman, and he's already he's already beaten the defenseman. I mean, if you look at him, there's the line. He's already passed this guy. And on you know a vertical level, he's already passed the other defender. So I know I can make a sauce up the boards, and Neuendijk is going to take off. I make the saucer to Neuendijk over the stick. He tries to turn around. He cannot intercept it when he's turning. And I have a two-on-one the other way. Now, interceptions are improved in NHL 24. But for humans, it's still not as good as it used to be. You don't get the big flail intercept animations, but you can get a lot of disruption animations. So my job here is to try and lure the defenseman away from the back post person, you know, from Nikita Kucherov or Jack Hughes, one of the two, I can't read the name on the back, and try and be able to force that cross crease pass. So I fake like I'm going to go around the net for a shot. I go backhand, 
to forehand. He tries a, uh, you know, a hero poke. I slide it to Nikita Kucherov, and it is in the back of the net. This is defense to offense in less than 30 seconds, and it wins me the game. Keep the attacking forward in front of you, drive him to the outside, allow your uh, defenders to come back, and as soon as they turn over the puck, it is counter offense the other way and a game winning goal of 14 seconds. That's how you turn defense into offense in a moment, and that is how you're going to win games in NHL 24. And those are some tips and strategies on how to become a better player in NHL 24. From on ice trainer settings to camera settings, all the way to behind the net, reading your reads on the breakout, and turning rush defense into offense, there's something for everyone to learn in NHL 24. I hope you enjoyed this video and will consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel, as well as checking out my other social media accounts like TikTok, Instagram, Twitter.